So welcome to the NHR at FAU seminar on um, a closer look at the Fujitsu A64 FX processor. My name is Georg Hager. Um, I haven't done the work actually for this, the stuff that I'm presenting. So the, the, the real work was done by Christy Alapat, Jan Laukemann and Thomas Gruber. Um, the Fujitsu A64 FX processor is a very interesting piece of silicon. We made a paper on it. Uh, last fall, and we actually received the PMBS 2020 Best Short Paper Award at the PMBS workshop at Supercomputing. So if you have uh, deeper questions or want to dive into the actual data and longer descriptions, I can refer you to the paper which is, has been published in the meantime. So why A64FX? The interesting thing is that um, this processor is the CPU that's used in the current top one supercomputer in the top 500 list, the Fugaku system. As you see, it's about three times as fast as the runner-up summit at the US and um, at a power that's, well, also about three times as high. Uh, it's an interesting processor because it was the subject of intensive co-design of hardware and software. And uh, although it's ARM-based, it's got a lot of features that make it well-suited for high-performance computing uh, workloads. So um, if you know our work, you know that we approach the subject of performance using um, simple performance models, trying to make sense of performance, trying to make sense of why a code performs as it does. And um, that's why I'm not going to dive in right away into the A64FX, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of our view on resource-based um, analytic performance modeling. So I'm, I'm like setting the stage here, okay, to get everybody on the same page. The main question that we ask ourselves when approaching performance is how much of some resource does some stuff take on some given hardware? And why is that? Okay, so resource is usually time, but it can also be energy, for example. Stuff is usually a code or a loop in a code and hardware is modern multi-core processors and GPUs. And this leads us directly to analytic resource-based first principles models. Analytic because they can be written down with pencil and paper in some kind of mathematical form. Resource-based, uh, as you'll see in a minute, because they are based on the resources that the hardware provides. And first principles because they are based uh, for the most part on knowledge that is obtained from the documentation and to a lesser extent um, from measurements and what we call reverse engineering. Of course, uh, since we're dealing with models, we have to specify what kind of assumptions we put into these models. And there's of course some restrictions on the stuff we run when we do the models. Usually the picture we have in mind when looking at performance and high performance codes is a code with a regular structure where we have compute phases, probably communication phases, and these compute communicate cycles, they alternate in some regular fashion. And if we look at a compute phase, it's always some kind of parallel code structure. This could be um, an MPI parallel, OpenMP parallel code, tasking with, without communication, whatever. So um, it's some kind of parallel computation that happens on the cores of our, um, of our system. And um, usually we assume that this computation is long enough that you can assume that there are no startup and wind down effects and it's purely repetitive. So that's what we call a uh, steady state, okay? We ignore wind down and, and uh, startup effects. Now under these conditions, we try to establish a runtime model that's a function of the stuff we want to run. So the code and its parameters like problem sizes and the hardware uh, that we are running on. All right, so this is very cloudy and high level. So let's get to a little bit more detail. So what are resource bottlenecks on computers? A resource bottleneck is something that has a maximum throughput at which it can deliver resources. And of course, there are many bottlenecks in high-performance computers, in any processor, actually, many hundreds of bottlenecks. So we say we assume that a resource bottleneck that we um, call I delivers some resource at a maximum rate, Ri max. Okay, this is the highest rate at which this resource can deliver um, to, can deliver its resource. And of course, uh, when I run a code, I demand a, a certain amount of those resources and the code, the amount of resources that I need for the code, we call WI. And of course, we have to squeeze this amount of resources 
through this bottleneck with the maximum rate Ri max. And the time this takes at least can be easily calculated. It's just the amount of resources divided by the maximum rate. And there might or might not be um, some, some latency lambda involved here. Okay, this is the minimum runtime, um, assuming that we're only limited by the single resource Ri. And of course, there's more than one resource, so there's more than one TI. And from these TIs, for all our resources that we put into the model, we can form an expectation. And this expectation is a function of all these times, of all these minimum runtimes posed by these resources. Of course, we don't know um, from the start what the functional form of this F is. And we will see later that this is one of the crucial points of the whole analysis to figure out what this F is. What's the expected runtime? What, how is it composed of the component runtimes in our model? Once I've got figured, that figured out, I can just uh, divide the work that I do, number of flops, number of bytes, number of iterations, whatever is a good metric for work. Uh, I can divide that by the expected runtime and I get an overall performance estimate. Okay, that's how resource-based performance modeling works from a bird's eye view. Now let's look at a very simple example where we only consider two bottlenecks and the two bottlenecks are data transfer to memory and execution of floating point operations. That's a very simple code updating uh, vector A in memory, it's actually a DAXP. And um, we're doing this in a loop with an iteration count of 10 to the seven and we have double precision um, elements. So uh, we assume two bottlenecks only, two resource bottlenecks. One is the peak performance, in this case, 192 gigaflops per second. The other one is the memory bandwidth, in this case, 40 gigabytes per second. And that's it. That's our simplified picture of the hardware or machine model. So the amount of flops, we want to squeeze through the flop bottleneck. That's two times number of iterations, so two times 10 to the seven flops. The amount of uh, data, we have to squeeze through the memory bottleneck. That's just the amount of yeah, bytes we have to transfer over the memory bus. That's three times eight bytes per iteration times 10 to the seven bytes. All right, so we can calculate two times the time we take at least to execute the flops, that's 104 microseconds, and the time we need at least to transfer the data, that's six milliseconds. All right, so these are our two component times, and now comes the crucial question, how do we compose these times to get the final prediction? So what's the functional form of this, of this function f of uh, t1 to tm? Now we could have different models here. A pessimistic model would be a model that does not assume any overlap at all. So we sum up all those times, which in our simple model would mean execution of flops cannot overlap with data transfer from memory. Or we could, uh, that's the other end of the spectrum, assume a, a very optimistic model with full overlap. So um, our functional depends is just the maximum of those. So the maximum of these minimum runtimes uh, is our optimistic prediction for the runtime. Okay, and this is of course an, a global optimistic prediction. So um, if you know your modeling literature, you know this is the roofline model. Okay, it doesn't look like it uh, because we used a time-based formulation, but you see the power of this time-based formalism as opposed to a, a performance-based formalism where it's really hard to come up with more than two bottlenecks. And in this time-based formalism, you can have any number of bottlenecks and you can even play around with the functional dependence f. Now, if we assume that the roofline model applies, then uh, t min, so the expected runtime for our code is the maximum of the two times we just calculated, so six milliseconds. And then I divide the work by the time and I get a maximum performance, what we call a light speed performance of 3.3 gigaflops. Okay, here you see the roofline model at work it becomes a little bit more clear here in this formulation, but what it really is all about is this maximum function here. This is the roofline model. All right, now in this talk, and as we look to the A64FX architecture, especially when we look at single core performance, um, we will see that it's not uh, usually a good idea to assume roofline assumptions, but we'll come to that. Before we get to the modeling, I'd like to introduce a little bit about the A64FX architecture. Uh, you should know there are basically two systems available from Fujitsu, the FX700 and the FX1000. The Fugaku supercomputer is an FX1000. Um, most of the data I'm going to present here was taken on an FX700 at the University of um, Regensburg Physics Department. 
um, but um, the differences are minor uh, with respect to uh, from the view of the end user. So here's a view of the A64 FX processor. It comprises 48 cores in each node. That's one chip. It's a CCNUMA architecture with four locality domains. Um, and each locality domain comprises 12 cores. And such a group of 12 cores with associated cache and memory interface is called a core memory group. So we have four core memory groups per node and one CMG is one NUMA domain. So there is a CCNUMA effect here. Um, so um, for most of the benchmarks we show here, we're going to be concerned with what happens on one core memory group. We have 12 cores. Each core is clocked at 1.8 gigahertz on the FX700. On the FX1000, you have a choice between 2 and 2.2 gigahertz. Uh, the instruction set is ARM uh, V8.2 with SVE extensions. So the new vector extensions and the compiler can actually uh, make use of that. Uh, the maximum vector length available in the execution units is 512 bits. So I can fit eight double precision um, elements into a vector. For GCC, uh, these are the flags that we used. You can also read the details in the paper. The L1 data cache is 64 kilobytes per core, private per core, at a cache line size of 256 bytes. That's four times what we have in typical Intel and AMD processors. Uh, the L2 cache is um, unified and shared cache of size 8 megabytes for one core memory group. Cache line size is also 256 bytes. The memory interface uh, interfaces 8 gigabytes of uh, HBM2 memory. So one core memory group has 8 gigabytes of memory, which makes it 32 gigabytes for the whole node. All right. So um, if you run a memory bound code, uh, you know what characteristic this code should have when you scale out across the cores. So here's some experiments on the A64FX in the FX700, comparing the performance in terms of bandwidth, gigabytes per second, versus number of cores for three different benchmark loops. Try it is just the stream try it that we all know and love. Sum is a sum reduction, summing up all the elements in a vector. And SPMV is a sparse matrix vector multiplication with, I think in this case, the HPCG uh, matrix. And we see the characteristics are quite different. Um, we see a clear memory band saturation for the stream triad from one to 12 cores, typical saturation pattern. We top out at a little bit more than 200 gigabytes per second, which um, translates into 117 bytes per cycle. Beyond one NUMA domain, if you fill the cores from left to right, so with compact pinning, you get this typical linear behavior for memory bound code. And if you um, have visited one of our node level performance engineering courses, you know why that is. It doesn't mean that the code suddenly becomes decoupled from main memory. It's just an, an, an artifact of the way the benchmark is done and that we use compact pinning. However, the other two benchmarks, so the sum reduction and the sparse matrix vector multiplication, they show a different characteristic, they're scalable. And in that case, in this particular case, a scalable characteristic is not a good thing. It's a bad thing. It shows that these codes are so slow that they cannot expose the memory bandwidth bottleneck. Both should actually be quite similar in characteristic to the uh, vector uh, stream triad, but they're not, they're scalable. So something's wrong. And um, if you look into this, you see that all that counts here for whether or not the code can saturate is the single core bandwidth. So understanding the single core performance of a code is the key to understanding or knowing whether or not it will be able to saturate the memory bandwidth. We want to deal here with sparse matrix vector multiplication ultimately, which for large matrices should be memory bound. So we want to see a characteristic uh, like with the stream triad. We don't want it to scale on the CMG. We want it to saturate. And the whole question is how do we get there? And can we understand why the code is so bad to begin with? To do that, we have developed um, a single core model for a sparse matrix vector multiplication, essentially all uh, streaming codes on this machine. And this model is a particular instance of the ECM model, the execution cache memory model. The ECM model is if you want a um, refinement of the roofline model, it helps us to understand and analyze the single core performance. You can also use it for multi-core performance, but it always starts 
with a single core. It takes into account the data paths and the data volumes that apply when you um, run a steady state loop on such a processor. And what it needs as input is a machine model, um, which is basically all the things you learn from the machine documentation, the bandwidth of these data paths, for example, uh, the throughputs and latencies of instructions executing on, on data and registers and so on. So this is all part of the machine model and the application model, which is basically the code that we execute, the assembly code, and uh, things like execution parameters, like problem sizes, array sizes. These two can be put together and they can be used to obtain traffic and time component predictions. So for example, knowing my application, knowing my machine, I can calculate how much data, how many bytes have to be transferred between the cache levels and between the L2 cache of memory, how many instructions have to be executed of which kind and how long that probably takes, okay? So I get components and these are the TIs I introduced in the beginning when I um, introduced resource-based performance models. Now, the secret is how do I put together these TIs? And this is uh, another part of the machine model, which we call the overlap hypothesis. The overlap hypothesis tells us how these different time components have to be plugged together to get a final execution time prediction. So this is where the function f comes in. This is where f uh, is put in. And that is a central part of establishing a model for an architecture. If you want to know more about this whole modeling process and what exact, exactly it means to establish a machine model and application model, there's a paper from last year where we wrote it all up. All right, so let's start with the in-core prediction. Of course, we need some prediction about how long it takes to execute the code, assuming that the data is in the L1 cache. So all we need is loads and stores and multiplies and adds and other stuff. And for that, we put in some, well, quite extensive machine knowledge. We have to know what execution units are there, probably how they are organized behind the reservation stations or ports, and what are the latencies and throughput numbers for these instructions. So for example, for the stream triad, this is the code the compiler produces. We have um, two loads, one store, one multiply add. So these are the four instructions shown here, and then some loop mechanics, okay? And uh, if we look at these instructions, two loads, one fuse multiplier, add one store, what we do in the, in the simplest case, we assume that the architecture is able to distribute or to, um, yeah, to apply these instructions in the most effective way possible using the full throughput of the ports. And of course, we assume that out of order processing and speculative processing works perfectly so that all the out of order resources are large enough to make that happen. And our picture we have in mind when, when looking at this kind of code is the following. We have two loads. Those two loads can be executed in a single cycle because we have two load ports. And also we have two address generation units that, that can calculate the addresses for these two loads. So these two loads can be done in a single cycle. All right. The FMA instructions can also be done in the same cycle. It's on a, it's on a different port and a different execution unit. So there's nothing that um, prevents this from being done in the same cycle. However, the store cannot be done in the first cycle because um, it cannot, be, you cannot overlap with the two loads because it needs an AGU. And um, the AGU has been blocked for the full first cycle by these two loads. So the store is separate on its own cycle, which means assuming full throughput, this code cannot be run faster than one vector length every two cycles. Okay, so for producing for processing one vector length, which is, uh, for example, eight elements, I need, I need at least two cycles. This is just rooted in the fundamental limitations of this machine, of this core. Now, of course, for the stream triad, the analysis is quite simple. Um, however, for more complex codes, you may wish to employ a tool. We have such a tool, it's called Osaka, the Open Source Architecture Code Analyzer. If you know Yaka, which was Intel's tool, this is like the successor, which is also applicable to other architectures, not just Intel. And it helps us a lot with static analysis and prediction of in-core contributions for the models. So what else do I have to know? Of course, um, in order to feed Osaka with the relevant data and to make this analysis, I need to know what's the throughput and the latency of different instructions. In floating point codes, usually I'm dealing with load stores, multiplies, and adds. So here's some 
numbers, just examples. There are lots more in the, in the paper. So um, for example, that a supercool throughput of a load instruction is half a cycle. So I can do two per cycle. The latency is up to 11 cycles. Depends a little bit on the details, but this is the worst case latency. Store has a throughput of one cycle and add half a cycle and a latency of nine cycles. So if you know Intel and AMD processes, you know that the uh, latencies of adds and multiplies, floating point adds and multiplies are of the order of three to five cycles. So this is quite slow and we will see that it poses a problem in some circumstances for the A64FX. The F add V is uh, special, it's an add instruction. However, it's a horizontal add that adds the entries of a SIMD register horizontally. And it has a huge latency of 49 cycles and also the throughput is not so good, okay? 11.5 cycles for a single instance, even if you have many back-to-back -back, um, horizontal ads. So, so much for the in-core pr um, predictions. I will come back to the two more concrete examples later. What about data transfers? So the machine is an FX700. Uh, we can look up in the documentation that the L2 cache can deliver one 64-byte uh, package per cycle, and it can take one 32-byte package per cycle from the L1 cache. Um, in memory, we have 117 bytes per cycle for reading and 64 for writing. This is our machine model for the data transfers. Um, our application model is we have the stream triad, two loads, one store, one multiply add. So we need to read C, we need to read B. Since we're using normal stores, we have a write all allocate for A and then a write back for A. So three reads of cache lines and one write of cache lines for each of these two data paths between L1 and L2 and L2 and memory. Now, what about the prediction? Um, from L2 to L1, we need three cycles per vector length just for reading the required cache lines. We need two cycles per vector length for writing the result back, A, okay? Um, for reading the data from memory, we need 1.64 cycles at the um, designated bandwidth. And for writing it back, we need another cycle. All right, so we have four time predictions. And now the question is, how do we put them together? Of course, we need one more thing, and this is the in-core um, prediction. For in-core execution, the L1 cache can deliver up to 128 bytes per cycle to registers, and I can store up to 64 bytes per cycle. And for that, I also have time predictions. So again, we have a, a bag full of time predictions, TI, and how do we put them together. How do these boxes overlap in time? Now we could um, make a lot of hypotheses about this. The most pessimistic hypothesis would be that nothing overlaps. So if you do anything in the cache hierarchy or if the registers talk to the cache in any way, reading or writing, nothing can overlap with anything. This would be the most pessimistic prediction. Yeah, with, it would yield a very pessimistic, very low performance. This is the no overlap hypothesis. And it's actually quite close uh, to what happens on Intel CPUs. Full overlap is the most optimistic hypothesis, and it's more along the lines of roofline thinking. Okay, everything overlaps: execution, load stores, um, write backs, everything in the cache hierarchy. So this is the full overlap hypothesis. We could also hypothesize that we have full overlap, but every data path is only half duplex, so that we can only read or write, but not both. Okay also an option. Or we could say we could have overlap um, for L1, L2 transfers. So basically the L1 cache is dual ported. It can look both ways to the registers and to the L2 cache. But the L2 cache is non-overlapping with respect to memory, also a hypothesis. So there are many, many combinations uh, of which I've covered only a few. How do we find the correct one? Again, we make um, we, we choose a benchmark like the stream triad, we make hypotheses and we compare the measurements with predictions that come out of the hypothesis. The best hypothesis for the FX700 looks like that. And um, what we see here is that we have non-overlapping of loads and stores in the L1 cache register data path. So we cannot do loads and stores at the same time. We cannot do reading and writing at the same time on the L2, L1 data path, but the writes can overlap with the L1 register data path. And with respect to memory L2, again, there's no overlap between reading and writing, but the writes can overlap with the reads 
on the L2L1 path. So this is just one of many predictions, but it turns out that for the stream triad and for many other streaming codes, it does the trick. It has a very good predictive power. So here we have the predictions in the one in one column and the measurement in the second column. So we are off a little bit here in memory, but uh, if you look at other kernels, which I'll show you on the next slide, it looks very good. So again, if you want to know the details of this process and how to put together a uh, hypothesis out of measurements, again, I have to refer you to this paper where we wrote up the whole process in detail. So here's the model validation for all our uh, the streaming benchmarks we considered. So copy DAXB, dot is just a, a scalar product, in it a write-only code, and then we have the Shinawa triad uh, 2D five-point stencil with layer conditions fulfilled and violated. And you see the error is usually below 10%. Okay, so this hypothesis, this overlap hypothesis, which is arguably quite complicated, seems to do a good job of predicting the performance of, of stencil code, sorry, of streaming codes, and also of codes with stencils that have cache reuse in the cache hierarchy. So it's not limited to pure streaming. You can also predict the performance of codes that do have cache reuse. Now, um, FX700 is a new machine, so we ran into some problems. There are some things you have to take care of when running code in, in order to get the best performance. Here for the, uh, for the stream triad, we recognize that uh, data alignment is important. What we see here is the runtime and cycles per vector length, so eight iterations um, with different data set sizes. So we see L1 cache, L2 cache, and main memory. We see that we only get the best performance, which is the blue line, if all the arrays are 1024 byte aligned. So that's where we get the best performance. Anything below that, or if you just don't care and uh, leave it to malloc, then you will not get the best performance. The, the, the deviations are small, the order of less than 10%. Uh, however, yeah, it's something to take care of if you want the best possible single core performance. So you have to align to a, an alignment boundary of larger than 32 bytes, at least. So alignment is important. Um, unrolling is crucial. Uh, this is rooted in the limited out-of-order processing capabilities of this processor. The out-of-order buffer is not that large, and it's also the, the reservation stations are split among two different stations, which means that unrolling as a means of helping the hardware to schedule instructions is sometimes crucial. On the left, we see the performance, sorry, the runtime and cycles per vector length of a simple 2D five-point stencil um, measured just measuring the, um, uh, the plain code without unrolling, however, with SIMD, and then with unrolling factor eight, and you see almost a factor of two of speed up, and also a very good agreement of the ECM prediction with the measurement um, with unrolling factor eight. With the sum reduction, we have an additional problem. It's not just reordering instructions and scheduling instructions. It's also about the compiler uh, being able to generate the best possible code. So if you do a sum reduction, and you want to vectorize it and you want to have perfect pipelining, you have to unroll it on two levels, one level for SIMD and the next level is modulo variable expansion for uh, pipelining optimization. If the compiler cannot do that, um, it will be limited at least by the pipeline latency, which is quite large on this machine. As I told you in the beginning, it's nine cycles. And basically um, this is what this code shows. If you don't do any modulo variable expansion on top of SIMD, you end up with a best uh, runtime of nine cycles per vector length, which is exactly the add pipeline latency. And only if you unroll on top of that, you get down to the expectation. Okay. So unrolling is important, not just because of out of order inefficiencies, but also because the compiler usually doesn't do the right thing, especially when um, some reductions are involved. The compiler does the vectorization, the, the GCC, but it does not do the additional modular variable unrolling for um, improved pipeline usage. So we are stuck with the nine cycles if we don't do the man unrolling manually, which we did for the blue line uh, using intrinsics. Now, um, once we get a decent single core performance that complies with the model, we can look at multi-core saturation. The, the plain ECM model assumes that the scaling is linear um, unless you hit a bottleneck. So this is why our ECM model prediction is linear here until the memory bandwidth bottleneck is hit. Uh, 
for the vector triad code, which doesn't have too many problems with out of order execution and pipelining, um, unrolling and no unrolling doesn't make a difference and it saturates at well, about five to six cores. For the sum reduction, if we do proper modular variable unrolling on top of SIMD, we get saturation. We need eight to 10 cores, but at least we saturate. The same is true for the stencil. So um, we can show that for all these three codes, saturation is possible. Sometimes you need to do some stuff by hand, especially with sum reduction, but it is possible with uh, limited effort to get to band the saturation. So this is the stage. This is uh, a picture of performance um, on this machine um, using simple codes and stencil codes. And now we turn to sparse matrix vector multiplication. Uh, assuming that uh, many of you know what this is all about, we have a sparse matrix in which most entries are zero. We multiply with a right-hand side vector and we update a left-hand side vector with the result. So this means that Usually the matrix is stored in some kind of compressed format. The sparsity pattern determines the access pattern to the right-hand side vector. So some indirect access is required to the right-hand side. And of course, depending on the sparsity pattern and how evil this matrix is, it may happen that the right-hand side access is so erratic that it destroys your performance, okay? But always the case, as you will see. In compressed row storage format, which is the standard format for typical multi-core processor is good enough for many applications. The code looks like that. We have a long outer loop over the rows of the matrix. We have a short-ish inner loop, which uh, goes over the number of non-zeros per row. And we have this indirect access here to the right-hand side vector. Now, if we give that to the GCC compiler, the code that it generates actually looks quite decent. It's vectorized. It has a gather operation. So we go through this um, step by step. The column index is loaded using this integer load here into the Z0 register. Then um, X is loaded using these indices, uh, using the, um, the gather operation. Then we have a load for the matrix entries, A, the second load here in the code. And then finally, we do the fused multiply add putting the result into the register Z1, and then there's uh, the loop mechanics, all right? So this is what the kernel looks like. It's actually um, decent. At the end of the inner loop, we have a horizontal reduction because we have to add up all the contributions, all the partial sums that have been collected across the inner loop. And this is done using the F add V instruction that I introduced in the beginning, which does a horizontal add to the register. All right, if we run that code, then this is what we get. CRS format sparse matrix vector multiplication with the HPC G matrix and dimension of 128 cubed. And we see perfect scalability to 12 cores, okay? Looks good, it's a scalable code. However, it's not what we want because we know this should be memory bound, okay? We should top out at 200 something gigabytes per second, we only get 100. So this is not the performance we want. Why? Now, uh, it turns out you can analyze this. The FMA update, um, it accumulates into this Z1 register with a latency of nine cycles, all right? So every time we go through this loop, we have to accumulate into the register. It takes nine cycles every time because we accumulate into every, every time into the same register. So this is the minimum we have to pay for this loop. In, uh, execution nine cycles. And then at the end of one row, we have to do the horizontal add of one 512 bit register. And even if we assume full throughput for this instruction, which may or may not be true, uh, we only can do it in, in at least 11.5 cycles because this is the inverse throughput of this instruction. And um, for the HPC G matrix, which we used in this experiment, the loop length of the inner loop is 27. Uh, and that means that a vector length of eight elements, you just, you have three full uh, iterations and then half an iteration. And this is not very much, this is not good, right? So um, if you put all these numbers together and you add them all up, you uh, and make the ECM model prediction, then just by looking at the in-core execution, not even taking data transfer into account, you predict a maximum bandwidth of 160 gigabytes per second for 12 cores. 
we know the bandwidth of the memory interface of one GM CMG is 200 something gigabytes per second, so we cannot saturate. This code is not able to saturate the memory bandwidth, even disregarding any data transfer, just looking at the in-core code. Okay, so this is why we don't get saturation. In practice, we don't even get to 160, we only get 100 for other reasons. All right, so, but, so we have to do something about that. Maybe CRS is not the right way to approach this problem. And what we did was we ran uh, the code with the Celsius Sigma storage format. Uh, Celsius Sigma was developed in 2014 here at RZE. It's a vector-friendly data format for efficient sparse matrix vector multiplication. Um, here we have a sparse matrix. Here's the CRS format. In CRS, you just squeeze out all the non-zeros. You uh, sorry, you squeeze out all the zeros. You shift the non-zeros to the left, and then you go through this row by row, as I've shown in the uh, introduction. In Celsius Sigma, we choose two parameters: a sorting range Sigma and a chunk size C. So the first thing you do is you sort the matrix according to the row length uh, on the sorting scope Sigma. So if Sigma is um, eight, then uh, you sort chunks of eight according to row length, and then you cut those chunks into chunks of height C, and you store data within these chunks um, column by column. So you choose a column major ordering of these submatrices of height C. And then of course, if you envision how a sparse matrix vector multiplication progresses in this case, you see that it's quite vector friendly because you can update the left-hand side uh, in vector chunks of height C, and you can choose C as a parameter in, in the format, and it's easy to adapt it to specific hardware. For example, on a GPU, you might want it, uh, might C um, want to be a uh, small multiple of the warp size, um, on a CPU, you might, it's, might set it to something like a small multiple of the vector size. Yeah. So um, vectorization unrolling along the chunk size is done. So you have a long loop depending on the non-zeros here, and uh, it's tunable, you have tunable parameters. So it's ideally suited for uh, vector-friendly architectures. So if you do that, we can um, do the ACM model again for the HPC G matrix, dimension 128 cubed, uh, we have a certain number of cycles for the loads, 20.3. That's basically the gather. Uh, we have a little store, which is overlapping. We don't have to, even have to care about that. We need to read data from the L2 cache and from memory. So overall, uh, we end up with a prediction of 28.8 cycles, which translates into a memory bandwidth, single core of 22 gigabytes per second. Okay, this is what the single core execution can give us as a memory bandwidth when we execute uh, the code with Celsius Sigma. Now, putting that into a graph, we start here and we assume perfect linear scaling until we hit the bottleneck. And you see that our model now predicts that we can saturate the memory bandwidth with just over 200 gigabytes per second. Okay, the measurement is shown in black. And you see that although we need almost all the cores to saturate, we can do it now. So we can actually get to the light speed for sparse matrix vector multiplication uh, for this matrix on this machine using the Celsius Sigma format. Yeah, so we saturate, but we need almost all the cores, which poses some problems sometimes, um, as we will see later. So here's again for comparison, the CRS number, which is like factor of 2.4. Um, behind in, on a single core basis and a factor of two on the full CMG basis. Now for HPCG, this is the picture we have. Measured memory bandwidth for HPCG matrix is close to 800 gigabytes per second, which is way more than 90% of what the machine can do. If you look at other matrices, and um, admittedly we've, we've selected a set here that's benign, so it doesn't have any evil properties. We will see later about other matrices. Uh, but these benign matrices all have performance um, well above 120 or around 120 gigaflops per second. So um, this is for the full node. And again, we compare Celsius Sigma with CRS. And for Celsius Sigma, we did um, parameter search for the optimal parameters. So it is possible to get a memory band the saturation with the Celsius Sigma format. CRS will usually not do the trick. Now let's look at other matrices, also in comparison with other 
architectures. Here's a collection of matrices. Part of those are from the uh, University of Florida collection. Part of those are from our own projects like SPIN26 or SKY2, so there's quite, quite a mixture here. And we're comparing here CRS and cell C sigma. And you see, um, if we draw the overall light speed model for sparse matrix vector multiplication, which has an intensity of um, at most one over six bytes per flop. So this is the highest possible intensity for sparse matrix vector multiplication if you don't use any uh, special structure in the matrix. And you see that some matrices are actually quite close to that. For example, ML gear or yield R1. These are typically matrices which have a lot um, long rows and uh, not many problems with load balancing. So we are in a situation where for some matrices, we can get very close to the roof line limit. Others have load balance problems or have very skinny uh, rows, which means that the right-hand side uh, vector access plays a role and the optimistic roof line model is actually not that optimistic. It's a little bit uh, down here. And of course, uh, there are some cases where it looks really bad, for example, Sky 2, which has access problems. So we can't assume full streaming access. And for the small matrices, we deviate a lot from the model, which is at least partially rooted in synchronization overhead. So for small matrices, obviously the barrier can be hazardous since we have an uh, open and deep barrier at the end of the execution. So to check this, we executed the benchmark without barriers which of course gives you wrong results, but just to see what happens if we remove the barrier. And especially for the small matrices, which fit almost or completely into the cache, we see a large boost in performance. So obviously uh, the barrier plays a role here and there in the process of investigating this. So the hardware barrier might help in these cases. And I show later some benchmarks that show you how much faster the hardware barrier is than the default software barrier used in the, in the GCC compiler. And of course, if the matrix working set is uh, smaller than the outer level cache, it is possible to get beyond the optimistic roofline limit, okay? 28 megabytes and 23 megabytes are both smaller than the outer level cache on this machine. Let's look at the consequences of this observation that although we can separate the memory bandwidth, it's just barely separating, okay? We, we need almost all cores. We need actually all cores to separate. So what's the consequence of this? And it's very interesting. It's something that's overlooked in many analysis of sparse matrix vector multiplication, that if you have a strong separation, if you need few cores to separate your memory bandwidth, you can absorb a lot of load imbalance in your execution. So here we have a situation where the memory bandwidth, we assume, just assume the memory bandwidth is saturated with three cores already, okay? So we start our execution with six cores, and then somewhere along the way, the load imbalance kicks in, and at the end, we only execute with three cores, but it's fine because we can saturate with three cores. So even though we have a strong load imbalance in terms of work distribution, there's no load imbalance in terms of execution, and, and the, the relevant bottleneck, like the memory bandwidth, is saturated all the way to the end. So we're fine. Even though the load imbalance is significant, we can still draw the full bandwidth up to the end. Now, what happens if we can only saturate with five cores? So we need five out of our six cores to get the saturation, saturated memory bandwidth. Now, at the beginning, everything is fine. We're using six cores, but to the end, when only three cores are executing, we don't get the full bandwidth. So on this machine, although the workload is the same, we cannot saturate the memory bandwidth up to the end and we have a performance loss. So to put it the other way around, if you have a machine that just barely saturates in sparse matrix vector multiplication, all matrices which have a moderate load imbalance will have a, uh, will have a performance loss. And this is the case for the FX700. Here's an impressive comparison for two matrices which show this kind of imbalance, free fermion and RZD3 for a machine that shows very strong saturation like the Intel Cascade Lake. We compare here two versions of load balancing in the code. We can load balance by row, assigning each thread the same number of rows, or we could load balance by non-zeros, assigning the same number of non-zeros to each thread. On the Cascade Lake, it hardly makes a difference, okay? Non-zero load balancing is a little bit better, but it hardly makes a difference. 
However, on the FX700, it's of the order of 10% or more, okay? This shows that you have to take care of load balancing more than on the more strongly saturating architectures. So much for the machine itself. We now uh, finally want to wrap it up by comparing with other CPUs, other popular CPUs at the moment, and the V100 GPU. For the CPUs, we choose um, Cascade Lake node with two Intel Xeon Platinum um, processors with 28 cores each, so a full node, and one node of AMD Roam, which is actually a node of the Hawk supercomputer at HLRS in Stuttgart, and then the V100 GPU. So here's a CPU comparison of SPMV. Um, on the right in this table, we see a comparison of the last level cache sizes, Fujitsu FX700, A64 FX has 32 megabytes, the AMD ROM in Hawk has half a gigabyte of last level cache. And we see the consequence of this on the left. The Cascade Lake has 77 megabytes um, of L3 cache and an additional 56 megabytes of L2 cache. Well, if you look at the performance comparison, um, and we draw the line here at a 500 megabyte working set. You see to the left of this 500 megabyte line, Cascade, sorry, um, the AMD ROM is really ahead in most of the benchmarks because of its huge L3 cache of 512 megabytes. So it's really an advantage here. Um, to the right, of course, we see the memory bound uh, cases and this is where the FX700 can really play out its, adva its advantage. Um, on the In the bottom panel to make the differences between Rome and Cascade Lake. Yeah, um, more evident, we plot the FX700 speed up. So the speed up of the FX700 with respect to these two processors. So the speed up is between, well, between one and 4.5, depending on the matrix. And of course, the speed up is highest with the memory bound cases. If we concentrate on the memory bound cases here, just zooming in, um, of course, the memory bandwidth should give us um, some kind of uh, estimate how much faster we can get. Uh, on the FX700, we have a memory bandwidth of just over 800 gigabytes per second. On the AMD ROM, 320. And on the Intel Cascade Lake, 220 gigabytes per second. That's pretty much the speed up we get for the benign matrices like ML Gear or DLR1. Of course, there are matrices in which the speed up is not up to the expectations. And this is the case either where we either have um, more or less strong load imbalance or where the access pattern, the sparsity pattern of the matrix is such that the access is not purely streaming and we cannot actually get to the memory bandwidth. Of course, you can figure that out by just measuring the memory bandwidth. And our liquid perf counter tool is actually equipped with that. So nowadays you can measure the memory bandwidth also on the FX700 and FX1000 with liquid. So here we see for reference the um, ECM roofline limits for these machines. And again, for the benign matrices, we scratch at these limits, but for the bad matrices, further analysis is in order. Now, finally, the comparison with the V100. The V100 has about um, three times the peak performance of the FX700 CPU and about the same observed memory bandwidth. So we are, for the memory bound cases, we expect about the same performance and actually we do. So for the benign cases, they are pretty much on par. Um, for those cases where FX700 is plagued with access problems and the access seems to be unfavorable um, for a cache-based machine, the GPU can get quite a speed up because this, the, the GPU can uh, cover latencies where a CPU-based system cannot. So this is the key advantage in these cases, but overall, at least for the benign matrices, they are on par and of course, Load balancing is also an issue we have to look into and probably improve for these values. All values or numbers I've shown so far have been measured, taken on the FX700 at the University of Regensburg. So I will give an outlook now of advanced features and stuff that you might only be able to see on the FX1000 because you need the Fujitsu compiler and the, um, an appropriate system environment to activate some of these features. First of all, large pages. We constructed the ECM model in the beginning using the GCC compiler and the measured data for uh, streaming codes using a machine that used the standard page size of 64 kilobytes. If you know how to do that, you can employ large pages and the uh, Fujitsu compiler does that by default for um, compiler generated code. And you see that 
if you do that for the vector triad code, you save about two cycles in memory per vector length. This is a significant speed up just by increasing the page size. And you see that the jump from L2 cache to memory is effectively gone. So for large pages, the L2 cache is fully overlapping, which um, of course necessitates an update of the ECM model. Another interesting feature that the A64FX shares with other CPUs, for example, the um, power-based CPUs is cache line zero. Cache line zero is a special instruction by which the CPU can claim a cache line without reading it first. So if you know that you're going to override a cache line completely, it is possible using this instruction to claim it in the cache and thus avoid the write allocate. And if you compare the application observe bandwidth for the stream triad. In black here, we have um, the standard code without zero fill, which tops out at about 600 gigabytes per second. Of course, if you add the right allocate, you end up at 800. But this is in this graph, we see the application bandwidth. Okay, And the application does not see the right allocate. If you use the zero fill, you get up, at, you get up to 800 gigabytes per second. So it, it works as intended and uh, you can actually avoid the right allocate. Of course, the more store dominated your code is without reading the data first, the more benefit you get out of this. And it's a factor of two, of course, for a loop that's purely store bound. So only has stores, nothing else. Of course, for sparse matrix vector multiplication, um, this cache line zero doesn't do any good usually. Um, there's another feature of the machine that is called sector cache. With a sector cache, you can restrict the use of cache ways for certain data structures. For example, in our sparse matrix uh, vector example, you could tell the machine that only two ways out of the available 14 ways of the last level cache should be reserved for the matrix because the matrix is pure streaming access. You don't have any reuse. So it doesn't make sense to put a lot of it into the cache. Here in this experiment, we investigated this using a dense matrix vector multiplication Daxby style. And what we see here is the memory traffic in bytes per iteration as we increase the vector size. The black line is without sector cache. And of course, if the vector size is around four megabytes, which is half the L3 cache, uh, sorry, half the left, last level cache, then the traffic goes up from eight to 24 bytes. That's totally expected behavior. If you restrict the number of weights for the matrix data to two or three, then this rise is shifted to larger vector sizes. So you can make better use of the cache for those data structures in your code that need the cache actually. And you can uh, lessen, uh, diminish the impact of the of pure streaming uh, data access patterns. And finally, as I mentioned already, the um, machine also has a hardware barrier facility. So with, with the Fujitsu compiler, you can activate it um, on the high, on the, on the execution level on the user level and it shows here's the barrier cost in cycles um, times 10 to the 4 so this is 10,000 here so if you do a standard barrier with a GCC compiler it costs way over 10,000 cycles for the whole node whereas for uh, the Fujitsu compiler with a hardware barrier we're down to um, about 2,000 cycles for the full machine and a very a few hundred cycles for one CMD so if your code is plagued with barrier synchronization overhead, then the hardware barrier may be just the right thing to do. All right, let's wrap it up. Um, some conclusions, we have constructed an ECM model for single core performance of the A64FX processor in the FX700 machine. Uh, we showed that this machine has a partially overlapping memory hierarchy. And especially if you use large pages, the L2 cache is completely overlapping, which gives you a really good single core bandwidth. Sparse matrix vector multiplication with large matrices. Um, there is, this is where FX700 shows a 2x to 3x improvement compared to top bin ROM and Cascade Lake systems. And it's competitive at least for uh, with NVIDIA V100 for sparse matrix vector multiplication. Some take home messages and lessons learned. We need single core optimizations. The compilers right now are not up to scratch. So um, especially open source compilers do have headroom for improvement with code, of, with code generation on this machine. Um, if we use the right format and the right unrolling options, then Celsius Sigma can actually achieve bandwidth saturation, which is good. 
Um, but proper load balancing is still crucial because you just about saturate and everything that has imbalanced load will uh, lead to a loss in performance because of the, yeah, the number of pores you need to saturate. The hardware barrier can, in some situations, reduce the synchronization costs. 